Hi friends, are you suffering from excessive sweating and are embarrassed by it? Do you know that in dermatology, we see and treat patients with excessive sweating? For those who don't know me, I'm Chris and I'm a dermatology trainee currently based in the west of Scotland in the UK. And in this video, we're going to explore all about excessive sweating, also known as hyperhidrosis, what causes it and the treatments we can do both at home and in dermatology in the UK. As I work in the NHS, which is the UK healthcare system, we are going to focus primarily on treatments available here in the UK. So what is hyperhidrosis? Well, hyperhidrosis is also known as excessive sweating, and this commonly affects a lot of people, including myself, and can be divided into two main types. We have primary hyperhidrosis, which essentially means excessive sweating without an identifiable cause. Now, there is a diagnostic criteria for this. So essentially, you need to have visible excessive sweating for at least six months duration without apparent cause, plus at least two of the following characteristics. Bilateral, which means affecting two sites and relatively symmetrical. It has to impair daily activities, happens at least one episode a week, onset before age 25, a positive family history of hyperhidrosis, and that the sweating stops during sleep. In primary hyperhidrosis, this typically affects areas rich in sweat glands, like the palms and soles of the feet, as well as the underarms or axillae. But you can also get other sites involved as well, such as the face, the scalp, and the genitals. Now, secondary hyperhidrosis means excessive sweating with an identifiable cause. This typically affects older adults and is generally more widespread or generalized and persistent. You may also get other associated symptoms like weight loss, fever, and headaches. Causes can include underlying medical conditions like diabetes, thyroid problems, infections, and so on and so forth. Drugs can also cause a variety of issues like hyperhidrosis. So have a think about any of the medications that you might be on or even over-the-counter medications. And I've listed some of the culprit medications right here. And if secondary hyperhidrosis is suspected, then your healthcare professional might want to do further tests like a chest x-ray or urine tests and blood tests. Now, for the purpose of this video, we're going to focus on primary hyperhidrosis once we have ruled out any other underlying cause. Why do we need to treat it in the first instance? Well, hyperhidrosis can be quite an embarrassing problem and we certainly don't want to look all sweaty as though we've just run a marathon, especially not during a work function or social event. Hyperhidrosis can also lead to infections like fungal infections and viral warts, which love the moist, humid environments. The first thing we can all do ourselves is lifestyle changes. And I know this is something really simple, probably quite straightforward, but it is risk-free compared to other treatments later on in this video and can be quite effective if used appropriately. Number one, keep a sweat diary. Keeping a sweat diary helps you to identify potential culprits or triggers to your hyperhidrosis. And this can include things like eating spicy foods, drinking caffeinated drinks, alcohol, and also being in stressful situations. Being able to identify your triggers allow you to be more mindful of situations where you're more likely to sweat, and this hopefully will allow you to try to avoid them if possible or set up countermeasures in these circumstances. Number two, avoid tight-fitting clothing and man-made fabrics. Instead, opt for loose-fitting clothing to help air those sweaty bits out. You can choose to wear clothes made up of natural fibers like wool, cotton, linen, or silk, and choose colors such as black or white that can help minimize the signs of sweating instead of colors like blue. For people who suffer from sweaty armpits, they can buy over-the-counter underarm absorbent pads. There are also specially designed shirts or undershirts that can be worn with integrated sweat protection properties. For people with sweaty feet, they can choose to wear leather shoes or even sandals rather than tight-fitting shoes made of synthetic fabrics. So try to avoid things like sport shoes or even boots. You should also change your shoes on a daily basis to allow the old ones to dry out. You can also wear sweat wicking socks made up of materials such as cotton, silver, and copper. And what they do is not only do they reduce the sweat production, they also help reduce the odor as well. There are of course absorbent foot soles and foot powder that you can wear twice a day to help relieve the sweating. Moving on from lifestyle changes, here are some of the topical treatments that we can do both at home and in dermatology to help reduce hyperhidrosis. Number one, topical aluminium salts. This is a type of antiperspirant that help reduce the sweat production and it's different from a deodorant, which only masks the odor. The antiperspirants in the UK contain aluminium chloride, 
and you can actually buy over the counter, online, or even get it as a prescription from your GP. And brands include things like Enhydro, Dry Chlor, All The Band, and Sweat Stop. I feel like based on my past experience using and prescribing them to patients, a lot of the patients would only use it for a brief period before stopping it, saying that it's too irritating to the skin. And so I would like to sort of show you guys how to properly use it to minimize the risk of irritation. In order to make it work as best as it can, you should use it at night to dry, clean skin. You should use it every night for the first few weeks. And once you've stopped sweating, you can then reduce it down to a few times a week as a form of maintenance. Remember to wash off in the morning using a gentle, non-fragrance cleanser and avoid scrubs or harsh soaps. One tip that I have to everyone who uses this product is do not shave the skin one day before after using the product just because it will sting like crazy. As we've just mentioned, aluminium chloride does irritate the skin and sometimes occasionally it can burn the skin as well, which is why we often do the steps as above to try to minimize the risk of irritation. If there is still skin irritation, despite all the steps that I've just mentioned, you may want to either start slow by doing perhaps a few times a week to begin with before working up to every night for a few weeks, or you can choose a strength of lower percentage. You can also use a weak topical steroid like hydrocortisone or Umovate, which is clobetamine on butyrate to help calm the skin down and reduce inflammation the day after you've applied aluminium chloride. I also want to take this chance to mention that there is no real data linking topical aluminium chloride with dementia, Parkinson, or even the development of breast cancer. So apparently there is an aluminium-free preparation called IXAL made from this company called Sweat Stop. And supposedly it works quite well on patients who suffer from hyperhidrosis of the underarms. And what it does is that it naturally normalizes sweat production without blocking the pores of the sweat glands. The manufacturer recommends applying it as a roll-on three times a day to begin with. And once you've seen an improvement, you can then lower down the frequency to twice a day and then down to once a day in the morning. Another topical preparation is called topical glycopyronium or glycopyrrolate. This typically comes as 0.5% to 1% and you can apply it up to twice a day. Unfortunately, it is not readily available across all centers in the UK under the NHS. And you can also buy over the counter as well. But in America, I believe you can buy as a cloth made from the company called Cubrexa. Moving on from topical treatments, we then escalate our treatments to oral medications. And they include medications like propanthalin bromide, oxybutynin, and oral glycopyrrolate. Now, these medications aim to block a certain chemical called acetylcholine, which is found at the end of nerve endings. And by blocking acetylcholine, they help to prevent the sweat gland from producing sweat. With any other oral medications, they come with their own set of side effects. And they include things like dry mouth, blurred vision, constipation, and even urinary retention, which can be quite distressing. Other than oral medication, we also have iontophoresis. With iontophoresis, this involves using a machine passing a weak electrical current through the water um, to the affected skin. This has been used as an effective treatment for hyperhidrosis affecting the axillae, the palms, and soles of the feet but actually we still don't know how it actually works. We generally use tap water as a medium, but in certain centers, we can switch tap water with glycopyrrolate solution to make it more effective. Sessions typically run around two to three treatments a week for a course of four to six weeks. And once you've seen an improvement, we typically encourage patients to buy their own machines at home so that they can do it themselves as a top up. Another treatment is the use of botulinum toxin or Botox. I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of Botox because we use this all the time in cosmetic dermatology to help with fine lines and wrinkles. And what it does is it also helps to block the acetylcholine at the end of nerve endings, which essentially helps to stop sweat production. Now, Botox is typically used on the underarms or axillae rather than the palms and soles because the nerve endings on the palms and soles are very sensitive and are multiple in numbers. So it can be quite painful and Botox can also cause temporary muscle weakness as well. The effect usually lasts for around four to six months and you will need a top up once it wears off. And with the latest climate in the UK healthcare system, Botox is not readily available in the NHS across all centres in the UK. And so it's best if you wish to try it to speak with your local dermatologist. 
largest. Next is microwave thermolysis or mirror dry. This is a new treatment that uses controlled microwave technology to destroy sweat glands without the need for surgery. And apparently it is reported to produce permanent results compared to oral medications, Botox and iontophoresis. And again, it is not available in the NHS, but you may be able to source it in a private dermatology clinic. Lastly, there are surgical options to treat hyperhidrosis but they are often considered as a last resort option because of the high risks and complications. Examples include curatage and cautery, which means shaving the affected area out, excising the affected skin or removing the whole area, uh, laser treatments, and even this uh, procedure called endoscopic thoracic sympathectomy. These are all invasive procedures and can cause severe side effects such as scarring, infection, compensatory sweating on the unaffected side and injury to nearby structures, which is why we only consider this if we've run out of um, options. And here you have it. These are some of the treatment options that we can do both at home and in dermatology in the UK. I hope you like this video and find this informative and interesting. If so, please give it a thumbs up as it will mean a lot to me. Drop me a comment down below if you would like me to make any other videos on specific skin conditions. Speak to you soon. Bye bye.